everyone. Today is the last session of the Virtual Flight Safety School. And at BOSE, we would like to thank you all for your participation and interest in these sessions. It was wonderful to connect with you, and we're pleased to see such a high number of participants showing interest and asking relevant questions at every session, making this Virtual Flight School a success. We hope that the learnings you have gained will help you becoming a better and safer pilot in your training and career path. Flight safety was key to this training, but it's also essential to us both in the way we engineer and produce our product. The A20 and the ProFly Series 2 aviation headset are both designed to providing you the comfort you need and a clear communication during your flights to let you focus on what matters. And no matter what type of aircraft you fly or the level of noise in your environment, there is a Bose Aviation headset in the right configuration to meet your need. I highly recommend you to visit our networks of resellers in South Africa. That way you can experience the product for yourself. You can also count on our support with global facilities also present in South Africa to maintain your headset and keep it TSO certified. We hope that you all enjoy the sessions and learned a lot from Scully's lifelong aviation experience. Thank you, and I wish you many safe and comfortable flying hours. I had the opportunity to take my very first flight at the age of 12, and ever since then I've been hooked on aviation. But it's pretty expensive. When I realized I couldn't lower the cost of flying, the only other way that I could fly was to be able to afford to do it on my own and start selling avionics and pilot supplies through a website. And that was an out-of-the-box way of thinking that allowed me to be able to pay for a few extra hours of flight time. No matter what airplane that I'm flying, I love to have my Bose A20 headset on. Having the best sound and performance that you possibly could have is imperative for having the best flying experience. Flying is a perfect opportunity to expand your world. I fly because of the freedom. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to lesson number six in the Smoke On Go Virtual Flight School series. Once again, thank you to Bose and uh, Pratt & Whitney, who have partnered us in this venture. This lesson tonight uh, is the last in the series, and uh, we hope that within a month or two, uh, we'll be up and running again with uh, um, another series covering different subject matter. The uh, lesson for this evening starts with spinning. There are four phases to the spin. The first phase is the incipient spin. Incipient meaning the beginning, the beginning of a spin. The next phase is the auto-rotation stage, and after that, the fully developed spin before we finally effect the recovery from the spin. So four phases. Incipient, auto-rotation, fully developed spin, and then the recovery. Right, so now... Um, we're going to start with the incipient spin quite obviously, but if the incipient spin is not contained, not stopped in time, that will end up going into the auto-rotation stage. So the one leads into the other. Now the thing is, what causes the build up to the incipient spin? It could be that you are in a situation in flight where you are at low airspeed for one reason or another. You're at low airspeed uh, and you are climbing somewhat. Maybe it is because there is terrain ahead of you or there are obstacles in front of you straight after the takeoff or whenever or wherever, but you have got the aeroplane at a low speed. Secondly, you have a high angle of attack uh, and the, the, the nose is somewhat up above the horizon. You could be heavy because you're overloaded 
or it could be that you're not getting the power that you would ordinarily get from the engine because you're at a high density altitude. So all of those factors could conspire to the uh, effect that you are sitting nose high, speed low, and you might even in fact be in a turn. If this is the case, and the aeroplane is not fully balanced, you could end up with a cross-control situation. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples shortly. But what happens with the cross uh, uh, with a cross control situation is this. Let's begin over here. Let us say that rather you are stomping on the right rudder and causing a yaw to the right because your right foot is heavy and you've got that rudder in and the nose is turning this way. But you're uncomfortable with the fact that you have a certain amount of bank on to the right and you want to raise this wing. So you lower that aileron and this aileron goes up like that. The definition of angle of attack is the, is the angle between the cord line of the aeroplane of the wing, the cord line of the wing, and the relative airflow. The cord line definition is the straight line joining the trailing edge of the wing or the aileron to the center of curvature of the leading edge of the wing. There's a straight line that would be there. Now, if the aileron is down, it immediately increases the angle of attack of this wing. And here it reduces the angle of attack. In that instant, if the speed is low, and it's too low, it's down near the stall, the wing will drop. It, the wing will stall and drop. It stalls and drops. And in that instant, it is the incipient spin that has begun. In a heartbeat, you are in the incipient spin. From that point, if recovery is not taken immediately, within two heartbeats, you are in the stage of autorotation which we're going to go to in a minute. So let's go over that again. We're in an aeroplane that is heavy, overloaded. We're trying to maneuver because there's something ahead of us, or we're looking back at something that we've just flown over. We're at high altitude. The airspeed is low. The angle of attack is high. You've put on bank and or you've put on rudder and you have got the aeroplane in that attitude. You've got an excess say of right rudder. Now what is happening is the left wing is coming up because of the further effect of rudder. You feel uncomfortable with this, so you endeavor to raise the lower wing with aileron. You push the stick over to the left. The aileron comes down. The angle of attack goes up because you're looking at a different cord line here and the angle between the cord line and the relative airflow. As that happens, this wing will stall. In the instant that the wing stalls and the nose and, and, and the nose drops because of the stall. The incipient spin is said to have begun. If you leave the aircraft in that situation, it is going to develop into a, an auto-rotation. Auto-rotation is going to occur. So now, the recovery. What is the recovery? Number one, 
You must unstall the aeroplane. You must get the wings below the angle of attack. That is number one. Number two, you must stop any yaw that there is or that there was because you were in, you were in a cross-controlled situation. The aeroplane was yawing somewhere. So what happens here is you, that you've got to unload the aeroplane. You've got to certainly centralize the rudder, but better still, oppose any yaw that there was with uh, opposite rudder. And then you've got to ensure that your wings are level, that the power is restored at the same time, and that you ease the nose back upwards gently and you get yourself flying properly. Incredibly, that is all that the authorities require of you in this day and age. All you have to learn about is the uh, spin recognition. Recognize the fact that uh, an, an, an incipient spin is imminent. And in that instant, you have to be able, I talked about a heartbeat. As the incipient spin occurs, you need to be uh, able to recover from that incipient spin. All that is required. You need never actually spin an aeroplane. But the point is that I firmly believe that everyone should have experienced a couple of spins before they, as they move on in, uh, in their training. Because uh, a spin is something that you don't want to see for the first time when it is occurring in anger. In the instant that this aeroplane starts with the incipient spin, one of three things is going to happen. You can either make an immediate recovery from that incipient spin, immediate recovery, and fly away safely. If you're at low altitude, and an incipient spin has occurred, the chances are that you're not going to survive it. You're going to lose, depending on the size of the aeroplane and the, the, uh, the, the, the amount of control deflection that there was, etc., etc. It's not uncommon to lose 100, 150, 200, 250 feet in the incipient spin. If an incipient spin occurs close to the ground, it's, it's tickets. You are going to make contact with the ground. And 10 to 1, you're not going to survive this. All right. And the third thing that is going to happen is that if you are indeed at altitude and you get into an incipient spin and you do not recover immediately, the next phase will be the autorotation stage. And you still have a chance of recovering from that. I said that the incipient spin, if not corrected, ends up in autorotation, which we still have to talk about. And from autorotation, it develops into a steady state spin. So in my time, in my time in aviation, I have lost a number of colleagues or acquaintances uh, as a result of stall and spin accidents. And where I haven't known the individual personally, I know of certainly of many other accidents. But the thing that is quite chilling is that when People have had an accident or lost their lives in stall spin scenarios. I have actually known those guys fairly well. So I'm going to take you through a number of these events just so that you get an idea as to what can happen and what has happened. So I'll start off over here with uh, 
with an air show that we once flew. This was at the old Baraguanath uh, airport next to Crown Mines. And we were doing an, an air show act with three tiger moths. Three tiger moths in a row. And there were three Snoopies with red barons. Snoopy versus the red baron uh, situations where we had guys dressed up as Snoopies with uh, shotguns and uh, uh, kennels, etc., etc., and we would throw things out of the tiger moths at them, and they would fire back with blanks, and the kids absolutely loved this, and we would make three or four passes up and down the runway, and uh, on the day there was a horrendous crosswind blowing across that particular runway. In each tiger moth, there were two guys, which didn't help for performance at an airfield that was at 5,700 foot. And with this huge wind blowing, uh, it, it really didn't help things. And we were traversing up and down in front of the crowd. And what happened was that we would do a dumbbell turn, like a procedure turn in IF, at the end of each run, we would do a turn through 90 degrees, reverse the turn, and come back down the flight line, and then we would turn and come around here, and down the flight line again, shooting at these guys, and they were shooting back, and this is what we were doing. That was what we planned to do. We never got that far. I was flying in the number two aeroplane. I told you that there was a horrendous wind blowing. And the people were here where you see these model aeroplanes. And what we had to do was at the end of the runway, we could either turn this way or we could turn that way in order to bring the aeroplane back. The wind was blowing hugely. The guy in the lead aeroplane, when it came time to turn, he turned, he came along here, the wind was blowing from you to where you see these aeroplanes parked, and he turned into wind, strong wind, slow aeroplane. In unit time, how far did he travel? He never traveled that far at all because he was into wind and the ground speed, ca ground speed came down immediately. Then he reversed the turn. As he reversed the turn, where's the wind now? The wind is from his tail and the airspeed went up horrendously. So much so that in the same amount of time, and he was trying to keep it tight, he overshot the runway completely. Low level, going with a very, very high ground speed, and he pulled the aeroplane, he had to get back on line. And as he was turning back, I was sitting over here in the number two position, and I thought to myself, what are you doing? You should have turned uh, downwind first to give yourself more space. He pulled it tight, Two heavy guys in the aeroplane, speed low, unbalanced, and in front of my eyes, I saw that aeroplane stall and go into an incipient spin. And amazingly, there was a lot of foliage at that point, at that place on the airport, lots of gum trees. And I saw gum trees breaking like matchsticks and the tiger moth turning into matchsticks. Boom! And there the aeroplane was. Accident number one. All right. Very tight turn, having overshot the runway, low speed, high angle of attack, and uh, because the show had to go on, and he was unbalanced, and that was the result. That was number one. Number two, there was, we were at an air show, they were going to open the air show with three of the locals flying ex-World War II uh, Fairchilds. Fairchild is not known for performance. It's a heavy, lumbering aeroplane that is underpowered. They were going to open the air show with the fly past, and they 
had no formation experience whatsoever. They got airborne. There was an aeroplane that was going to be in the left, on the left, one on the right. As they got airborne and they were still at low level, the leader turned out. The number two, it, it's a, very difficult to fly in these aeroplanes because of, to fly formation because of the blind spots with the upper wing. And the, uh, the aeroplane got loose over here. This fellow might have been unbalanced. This guy was certainly struggling. Or a situation of um, a lack of experience straight after takeoff, still low, aeroplanes underperforming, disorientation trying to get into position and struggling with uh, visibility because you can see if there was a pilot in this white aeroplane he wouldn't be able to see the, the 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 harvard that i'm holding up here because of the blind spot created by the wing not so and the next thing boom incipient spin and he was only at 150 200 feet straight into the ground very very sad Another situation was when there were two guys in a Mooney participating in an air rally. It, it was vital for them to meet a certain time over a point. They throttled back, the, cap, the pilot, the pilot of the aeroplane, throttled right back to make the time to delay the arrival over the turning point. At the same time, a turn was involved. The turn was unbalanced and before you could say Jack Robinson exactly where the turning point was boom an incipient spin resulted and they were too low to recover and they went into the ground these things happen they happen in crop spraying uh, particularly in crop spraying because Crop spraying aircraft take off with a horrendous amount of insecticide in their hopper tanks. Uh, almost the size of a, a, a jacuzzi full of insecticide. Those aeroplanes are very heavy. Not all fields are uniform and uh, they aren't all straightforward. Some of them have got telephone wires or electric wires that run across across them and some of them have got trees at the end etc etc and one of the guys I know survived a situation where he went into an incipient spin he experienced he didn't go into an incipient spin he experienced an incipient spin at low altitude and survived it trees as well they caused it but yet they saved his life the other guy wasn't that lucky I said you're either going to recover immediately from the incipient spin. End of story. You live to fly another day. Or at low level, you're not going to survive an incipient spin that occurs down there near the ground. And then the other thing is that if you happen to be up high and you get into the, an incipient spin, then if everything is left within a second heartbeat, you will be in the autorotative stage. Okay, so that enough said about the incipient spin. That has been actually and remains a huge killer. You have to understand what is going to lead to this and you've got to take immediate action to counter the effects of that incipient spin. And now we assume that we do not take any action and we assume that we're nice and high. So the aeroplane is going to go into the autorotative stage. So we've taken our aeroplane we brought the power back to simulate adverse conditions. We brought the power back by about 33 and a third percent, maybe as much as 50 percent. We brought the power back. We've raised the nose. The speed is low. The nose attitude is high. The angle of attack is high. 
we stand on the right rudder. We apply quite a lot of right rudder. The, 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 no, the nose yaws to the right. The left wing rises. We're uncomfortable with this wing coming up. So we push the aileron over to the left. This aileron goes down. That aileron goes up. This wing the, uh, has an angle of attack that increases to the point where you're at the stalling angle of attack, if not further than that. And as that happens, as you get to the stalling angle of attack, at about 16 degrees angle of attack for these, these aeroplanes, typically, this right wing will drop. As the right wing drops, so a relative wind, you've got the relative airflow coming from the front, but there is one from below as well. The net result of these two is to increase the angle of attack even further, which deepens the stall of this wing. Right, it really is in a bad situation. This wing over here, look where the aileron is. It is up. The, by definition, the cord line is the straight line from the trailing edge of the aileron to the leading edge of the wing. All right. And what happens as well is that as the wing goes up, there is a relative airflow from here. Coupled with the relative airflow from there, is a reduced angle of attack that is below that of the stalling angle of attack. It has reduced the angle of attack to below the, the stalling angle of attack. Therefore, you are at or close to what they call the CL max, the maximum amount of lift that you can in fact get from the swing. We can therefore say that this wing is flying. It is the flying wing and it is experiencing less drag. It's experiencing less drag because its angle of attack is below the stalling angle of attack. This wing is as dead as a duck. All right, it has stalled good and proper and it has got with this huge high angle of attack, it has got a lot more drag. It's got a lot more drag. So this wing is being retarded and this wing is advancing. This one is faster. It is, has less drag and it has got more lift. And this one is as dead as a duck. Completely stalled, lots of drag. And this is what is happening to the aeroplane. As soon as that happens, the aeroplane side slips. When the aeroplane side slips, there is another flow of air, relative flow from here. And when it hits the tail over here, does this sound familiar? It's going to weathercock. So the nose comes down. And now we are in a situation where the, the spin is in the we're not in the full spin yet. We're in the autorotative stage. There is a huge engine there. There is a machine that is driving this rotation. Completely stalled. Flying nicely. Aeroplane slipping. Nose coming down. And the autorotative stage has begun. Now, in the flying schools... We teach immediately that if you are going to go into the autorotative stage and from the autorotative stage to the fully developed spin, it is very important to have your controls put in a very definite position. The stick must be back and centered and held exactly there and nowhere else. The rudder must be fully in and held there and nowhere else. And the th throttle must be brought back and the engine brought to idle. 
The reason that this is so very important is, as you will see later on, the effect of moving the elevators up and down, moving the stick forwards and backwards in the spin, and the elevators moving up and down, and introducing pitch forces, or the effect of changing the amount of rudder that you are using, or the effect of power, is to unleash a whole lot of other circumstances that will leave you baffled and confused and therefore frightened. So we always adopt the attitude that if we are going to teach spinning, we talk about that second heartbeat when you're going into the autorotation phase. We want the controls put in a firm and definite position. Stick right back and centered and held there. Rudder fully in, throttle right back. Because, as I said, if any of these parameters are changed, then you have no idea what sort of surprises lie in store for you. So don't ever try and get clever and do something else. Do it the same way all the time every time the same way. We said then that we have got a motor that is driving this auto rotation. We've got those factors and we're not introducing anything else. And what will happen is that the aeroplane will auto rotate for anywhere between two to three turns before it actually gets into the steady state, fully developed spin. For two or three rotations, this aeroplane is settling down. It's still building up towards the spin. Now, what do we mean by that? What we're saying here is that there are a number of moments acting on this aeroplane as you are auto-rotating. Six or eight moments. Let's have a look and see. Aerodynamical moments. There is the drag of the downgoing wing. There is the loss of lift on the downgoing wing. It's two. There is reduced drag for the upgoing wing. There is plenty of lift over here. So that's four. Then the aeroplane has slipped like this. There's wind, a relative wind from below that has come up against the fin and it has caused the aeroplane to weathercock. That's number five. And then, as the aeroplane is being held around and it's doing this, not only was there a wind from here, but as this tail moves towards my face, like that, okay, there is a, a relative airflow that strikes against the fin over here, and that opposes the spin. So those are all aerodynamic moments. One, two, three, four, five, and six. There are also what they call inertial moments. Let's say that you're in the spin. Do you see that as the aeroplane is spinning like this, if there is any mass in the front, that is thrown out and upwards like that, and if there's mass in the back, and we talked earlier on in one of the lessons about heavy guys sitting in the back of a Harvard, how the tail is thrown out and downwards like that. All right, that is a moment of inertia. That makes, there were six aerodynamic moments, 
This is a moment of inertia, boom, that is the seventh. And we said that if you happen to have fuel in wingtip tanks, there's a wingtip tank over here for your long range escapades and there's a wingtip tank there and you have fuel here and there, that is going to throw the wings into a level situation like that. It could even be that if you had your engines like this, the same thing happens and the wings are thrown into that attitude because of high moments of inertia. And we also mentioned earlier on in one of the lectures, round about session two or session three, there was a gentleman that phoned in and said, why can, am I not allowed to spin my error commander? And I said, I said that we would cover that, we would talk about that. And the error commander, it's a twin for heaven's sake. Who wants to go and spin any aeroplane that has got heavy engines in the wings and you have a very, very strong moment of inertia as a result of the weight that you're carrying in the wings? Cherokee 235, for example, that has got wingtip tanks, they integral. They, they built in to the wingtip. And if there was no fuel in the main tanks and you had fuel in the tips, my guess is that in the pilot's handbook, they're going to say to you that spinning is very definitely prohibited because of the moments of inertia. So there are eight moments, six of which are aerodynamic. Two of them are... Uh, inertial and they're all jockeying for position they're all, all uh, trying to balance out each other and eventually when all eight are in equilibrium that is when the solid state or fully developed spin begins but all along all along you don't want to mess with anything over here because of the surprises that lie in store i'd say this over and over again that stick is held back here you can't get a fright and let go of the stick because it's going to cause something else that is going to spoil your day that stick is being held here that rudder is in and the throttle is brought back to idle So the aeroplane has gone through about two or three turns in the auto-rotation stage. There are these moments, aerodynamic moments, and there are inertial moments, and they have all reached a stage of equilibrium, and now the steady state spin begins. And once you're in the steady state spin, this, this phase can last for as much altitude as you have available to spin. The aeroplane just spins away merrily. I once took a Harvard up to 17,000 feet and I did 21 turns of spin. About three were in the auto-rotative stage and then the other 18 were, uh, were in the fully developed spin stage. And the aeroplane spins away merrily. There is very little stress on the aeroplane whatsoever. The airspeed is low. If you, had, if you happened to look at the airspeed indicator, you would see that the speed was very, very low. And the aeroplane is essentially just falling through the air, spinning away merrily, provided you don't mess with anything. So let's start with the, with the engine. As, as we deliberately started the auto-rotation stage, I said to you, we pulled the throttle right back. The thing is that the aeroplane is spinning rapidly. The, the, engine, the engine 
has this propeller over here that is spinning, and that is a gyroscope. And the more you increase the power and cause the propeller to turn faster and faster and faster, the more the gyroscopic effect is on, or the stress is on the propeller blade, A, B, the boss. In other words, where the blades join up at a central point, enormous pressure over there as well. So you've got this uh, a huge force on the spinning propeller if you open up the power. But another two things happen. Assuming that you are in an American aeroplane where the propeller turns clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. All right, so it's clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. And you are in a spin to the right. I started off with the right. We'll eventually get to a spin that's being done to the left as well. In fact, any moment now. So what happens is that that propeller is turning clockwise as viewed from the cockpit and you are applying a force exactly there. Okay. There she is. She's spinning. You are applying a force there. That precesses through 90 degrees to there and it pushes on the blade at the bottom and what happens then is it pushes the nose down. It pushes the nose down and it gives you the wildest ride imaginable. So here that propeller is, it's turning like this, you're spinning to the right, the force is being applied here, it's acting there, it's doing this with the propeller and the aeroplane is up here now, not so. It's pitched down. And as the nose comes down, so the spin radius reduces. And the rotational speed goes up horrendously. And it gives you, as I said, the wildest ride you would ever imagine. So... That is the one parameter you don't mess with. But let, we said, what about the left-hand spin? Now we're doing a spin to the left. A spin to the left. And the propeller is turning this way, clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. As this blade comes up here, this is where the force is being applied. We know that... It precesses through 90 degrees to there. And what happens now? The nose comes up. And you are in a flat spin. That, that, that is the, 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 one of the aspects that gives rise to the flat spin. And we all know that the flat spin is a dreaded maneuver. You don't ever want to end up in a flat spin. So when I hear stories about people getting into a spin and then using power this way or that way in the hopes that it's going to help with the recovery, all it's doing is, in a spin to the right, it's bringing that nose down and pushing the speed up. And to the left, it's pulling the nose up. If you are flying in a tiger moth or a chipmunk where the engine turns the other way, then a spin to the right would be the flat spin, and a spin to the left would be the one where the nose comes down very, very dramatically. But we're talking on the ground over here, and we're working things out for themselves. But I can assure you, up there, when this is all happening, you are not going to be able to think this out. And when... For those that are aerobatic nutters that do inverted spins, all right, inverted incipients, 
which gives rise to inverted order rotation, which gives rise to the inverted spin. In the inverted spin, to the right, with power on, the aeroplane will go flat. To the left, with power on, it will steepen up and spin a lot steeper. And believe you me, anybody that can work it out when that's actually happening is more than a genius. Okay, so we understand that we don't want to play with the throttle. The throttle must stay right back. It saves the blades, it saves the propeller and crankshaft, the, the, the boss and the crankshaft, and it also does not result in a change of the state of, of equilibrium that you were in. Okay, we also said that we've got to keep that stick right back throughout. Now let's see why. As the aeroplane spins, as the aeroplane is spinning, what did we say about a spinning mass? A spinning mass is a gyroscope. It has gyroscopic characteristics. So as the aeroplane is spinning like this, can it be said that the entire fuselage, the body of this aeroplane, is uh, a gyroscope? And indeed it is. If you take the stick and you push the stick forward, the moment you push the stick forward, are you not applying a force there? So the tail is coming up, the nose is going down. You are spinning to the right, you're spinning to the right, the, no the tail is coming up, the nose is coming down. This is the force that is raising the tail. It transmits through 90 degrees to the wing. And what does it do? It pushes this wing up. So now the spin radius reduces. The rate of spin increases. You push the stick forward and vroom, there the aeroplane goes in a spin to the right. Suddenly spinning faster. That's enough to boggle anybody's mind. Therefore, you keep that stick firmly backwards. Okay, now, if you were spinning to the left, you're spinning to the left, this here is what they call the B, B for Bravo, B for body. This is the body uh, gyroscope. The aeroplane is spinning like this, and you apply stick forward, and the nose goes down, the tail is lifted, the force is applied here, the aeroplane spinning left, 90 degrees later, that's where it is acting here, okay? And the same thing happens. As you push this, the stick forward, whoop, 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 the spin rate increases. So, why do we not talk about what happens with the A gyroscope? There's a gyroscope here as well, the wings. So in common parlance, we talk about the B gyroscope being the body one and the A gyroscope, which is out here on the wings, that is the aerofoil one. And this is the one that must predominate because if the a gyroscope predominates and it is the strongest, it brings you to that situation. We always want more mass over here than we want in the wings for these spins. The other thing is that as you apply forward stick and that starts happening like that, the tail comes up, we said in a spin to the right, the right wing will come down and the bank angle steepens, the spin radius reduces, the speed goes up. Another thing happens. Have you ever seen a figure skater or a ballerina or a top gymnast and they're doing a spin, they're pirouetting around on their feet and they've got their hands out here or their arms out here or whatever and the mass is spread out this way. And as they bring everything in, 
the spin rate increases. That is the conservation of momentum. Right, you've got all this momentum, and it's spread out all over the aeroplane because of the attitude that you're in, you, and, and you're, you're, you're not spinning that fast. But as you push forward on the stick, and the nose comes down and steepens, the spin radius reduces, the aeroplane spins a lot faster. So here you are in this aeroplane that you've just bought, and you're saying to yourself, uh, I'm, you're in a spin and you say, how do I get out of the spin? And you're rocking the stick forwards and backwards, trying everything. How many times haven't I heard somebody say, I tried everything. I put the stick forward, I put the stick back. I put the stick forward, I pulled the stick back. I opened the throttle, I closed the throttle, etc., etc. Every time you do that, you're up upsetting the equilibrium and you are making the... Uh, uh, recovery absolutely impossible and that's why we say and I'm saying it again for standardization and for sanity so that you are not confused or frightened or both you keep that stick right back you keep the rudder right in and you keep the throttle right back until the moment comes that you wish to effect the recovery. Right. So now we've done the steady state spin. If you want to and you've got enough height, you can spin for as many turns as you want to. There is no stress on the aeroplane whatsoever. The airspeed is low. Okay. And it's almost quite pleasant. From time to time, one of those moments will predominate. The inertial might predominate slightly, or one of the aerodynamic uh, 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 moments might predominate, and the aeroplane might oscillate a little bit in the spin. But by and large, it is gentle and pleasant. Now, you come to the point where you want to recover. When you want to recover, the first thing that you want to do is you want to break the, the auto-rotative aspect of the aeroplane. You want to get rid of that. So you apply opposite rudder and you apply full opposite rudder. As you apply full opposite rudder, you've introduced this new aerodynamic moment and the aeroplane is going to start slowing down in the spin. You are trying to break all the aerodynamic moments that are causing the rotation. And once the rotation stops, which typically takes about three or four seconds, you actually have a little rhyme in your head that comes from when you were doing uh, your basic training in the military and everything went to the beat of one, two, three, one. Right. If you if you if if if, if they were commanding a turn to the left or the right while you were on the parade ground, it was one, two, three, one. As you hit that rudder, opposite rudder, whichever rudder it is, to stop the rotation, you call one, two, three, one. The stick comes forward. Because you've broken the aerodynamic turning moments. Now you are push the stick forward and there's you're in for no surprises. You're not going to get this gyroscopic precision because of the B gyroscope or the A gyroscope. You just push the stick forward and you unstall the aeroplane. You get the wings below the stalling angle of attack. From then it's easy. Let the speed build up, ease the aeroplane out and apply a little bit of power. After this, we'll discuss a couple of other issues. And then at the end of the session, I will be available to answer your questions. Thank you. We've gone through all phases of the spin. And this would be a good time to say that generally in aviation, but more so with spinning, 
You should never arrive at a point in the flight that your brain hasn't got to at least 10 minutes before the time. Because, particularly in the spin, there is so much happening and the characteristics of the spin change so very, very quickly depending on power input or stick position or aileron position. We never covered that, but the ailerons will cause an upset in the aerodynamic moments. And that's why we say that that stick has got to be kept absolutely centralized as well, because you don't know how aileron input is going to affect the characteristics of the spin. So we say, do it the same way every time. And unless you are in the world of advanced aerobatics, certainly advanced before you get to unlimited aerobatics, or as, uh, you're operating as a professional display pilot, then you should never ever end up in a situation where you are making these abnormal um, control inputs whilst you are spinning. Do it the same way every time. Do not get clever and say, let me have a look and see what happens, All right? And rehearse this in your mind. Get there at least 10 minutes before you've actually tried to do that spin. So having said all of that, let's just look at a couple of practical aspects regarding spinning within the aerobatic environment. We've been through six lessons here. We have discussed aerodynamics left, right and center, and yet we've hardly made a dent in the subject. But we have certainly covered some salient points. But let's just take, for example, uh, a stall turn what the Americans call a hammerhead. Let's run through a hammerhead and see how all of these aerodynamical aspects that we've talked about play a part. We've decided we're going to do this hammerhead turn. We dive to get enough speed. We level off because we might be showing the judges that this is the begin if you're flying competition. We're showing the judges that this is the beginning of a maneuver which uh, always begins with a straight and level uh, component followed by a recovery to straight and level. And here we are, we've got enough speed for the stall turn. And as we pull back on the stick, as we pull back on the stick and we pitch this nose upwards, we pitch the nose upwards, endeavoring to get to the vertical. Remember that that propeller is turning clockwise as viewed from the cockpit. And as we pull back on the stick, are we not applying a force at the top of the propeller there? Yes. Does it not precess to there? Yes. And in that instant, the nose, yours to the right yours to the right, and we have to give a little bit of left rudder. Lesson number one. Otherwise, your maneuver is doomed from the start because you are pulling up skew. Right, so you pull back on the stick and you experience this, uh, this uh, your to the right. You counteract it with a little bit of left rudder, and then it's over. It's over because you've hit the vertical. See there, the vertical. And we're hitting the vertical, and as we climb, we've got full power over here. Do you remember us talking over and over again about uh, slipstream effect? And the slipstream comes around, and it acts on the fin like this, and the nose goes to the left, and here you are going up vertically, but you are holding right rudder. You're holding right rudder as the speed decays. And the more the speed decays, you're holding more and more right rudder because the 
helical effect is becoming greater. As you get to the point where you are ready to turn this aeroplane around through 180 degrees, remember, we said this is what happens. You pull up to the vertical, you apply rudder, and you turn through 180 degrees, thereby effecting a 180 degree change in direction. But as you apply, what rudder did I say we're going to use? Which rudder should we use for the stall turn? Let's, let's stall turn to the left. We built this rudder over to the left, and the aeroplane does this. Okay, it starts doing that. Do you see that this wing is coming around faster than that wing? Further effect of rudder is to cause roll. What is this aeroplane doing? It's beginning to roll towards the left. It's rolling towards the left. Just because of the further effect of rudder. But... What else is happening over here? The speed has come right down. The power is at full power because you wanted to get as much height as you could going up. You don't do this with reduced power. You're using full power. What is the torque reaction going to be like? It's going to be high. So as this, this propeller is belting away clockwise as viewed from the cockpit, You've built it on the left rudder. It transmits through 90 degrees and it pitches the aeroplane onto its back. Now you're sitting over here. You've got a rolling moment. You've got the speed down to below, almost below zero. Right, it, the speed is very, very low. The angle of attack is high. The aeroplane has got a mind of its own and it's pitching on its own. All the ingredients are there for a spin to develop. And if you're in a closely coupled aeroplane that is very, very sensitive, like a pit special, it becomes difficult to identify what is actually happening. Is this aeroplane moving such that it's going to end up in an inverted spin? Or is it moving such that it is going to end up in a positive spin? And at that moment in time, you can either exacerbate the spin by making the wrong inputs, or you may, might make the right inputs and recover. But plenty of guys have actually had accidents because they have not been able to uh, arrest the spin in the first place, and then they haven't worked out what was actually happening. So there are institutions around the world where they teach spin recovery. But essentially, you've, you've, you've seen that power causes such havoc when it is applied in the spin. The very important thing is to, uh, is to throttle back completely. And in the modern day aeroplane, where there are there's such design inputs have been made in order to have aeroplanes almost spin-proof or to have them be able to recover on their own. You let go of the stick. Let go of the stick. It will find a place. But from that point onwards, there will be no further aerodynamic or inertial inputs that are being made. So it's throttle back and let go of the stick. See what the aeroplane does and then effect their recovery. Otherwise, it just gets too confusing. In the world of display aerobatics, they do some really weird and wonderful things. They do not only flat spins, they do flat accelerated spins. There is a way of accelerating the spin, right? And they do them erect, they do them inverted, and they do them in knife edge. Those are variations. But these are done by top class aerobatic pilots that have spun the aeroplane more times than, than you would ever wish to imagine. Spinning 
also costs, never mind what it costs in terms of fuel for practice, but there is a huge load when you are doing flat spins and you are doing powered on spins in order to get them flat and accelerated. You're putting tremendous strain because of the gyroscopics on the engine mountings and those have to be changed every now and then. Every now and then, couple of displays, engine comes out, new engine mounting rubbers, put the engine back. And you have to take great care of your propeller. You've got to have a lot of trust in your propeller because the forces on the propeller are enormous. That is why that is why they have gone from metal propellers to composite propellers. They are lighter, they are somewhat flexible, all right? They're very strong and usually in most cases they go for three blades so that any forces that are generated gyroscopically are spread across a disc that has three blades instead of two. Please be careful going out there. Make sure that you are not learning your spinning from a guy that is experimenting in the first place. This is, this is a discipline that takes no prisoners. You've got to understand what it is that makes an aeroplane spin. And as I said, when you go and do those spins, do not arrive at any point in that spin that your brain hasn't got to a long, long time before you set out to spin that aeroplane. Thank you. That concludes everything I have to say about spinning for the time being. Our very special guest this evening is uh, Tony Forbes. He is the owner of uh, Cirrus South Africa, uh, based at uh, Lanseria, and uh, uh, Tony is going to speak to us about the flight planning and execution of uh, some incredible long distance flights that he has done. We've been talking about uh, the safety in uh, airline operations and uh, what do you do in the event of the loss of an engine. But here is a man that has crossed the Atlantic Ocean in single-engined aeroplanes no fewer than eight times. Now, uh, Tony, uh, I understand you've been flying for, what, about 15 years or so? Thanks, Kali, yes, um, and thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, about 15 years, I've uh, been involved in the Cirrus aircraft for the uh, probably the last five or six years. You uh, make mention of single engine aircrafts and, and flying over oceans, it's something that I probably wouldn't do if I was uh, in something that wasn't as advanced as a, as a, a Cirrus aircraft, specifically an SR-22 and the SR-20. It's the piston engine uh, Cirrus uh, 22 that you have crossed yeah, the yeah. the uh, Atlantic with. Uh, what engine does that have in so it? So that's got a, um, a Continental uh, 310 horse, standard engine, nothing fancy about that. Um, but it's what, what's around the engine, uh, the engine management system in the way of information, uh, exhaust gas temperatures, cylinder head temperatures, fuel flows, uh, fuel management systems, um, everything that that makes decision making while you're in the air uh, that much easier. The technology that's out there now uh, and the weather apps uh, are so much better than they were in the old days. Um, planning software, auto routing software, uh, gone are the days that you sit in the FBO with a JEP chart and try and plot the route that you're going to take, write it down on a flight plan, <laughs> take it up to the tower, uh, get it rejected, go back down, fix it, take it back up, and eventually, uh, you know, four hours later, you're off. I can see that this type of flying will most certainly grow upon you. And, you know, with all this technology, it is a 
completely different ball game to the way that things were in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s when they were flying these aeroplanes out from uh, from America to South Africa and you never had any of the things that no. you are talking about no. now. I think the safety level has gone up exponentially. Um, it's really important to emphasize though that if you're going to use these tools then know how to use them and then use them wisely and have time on your hands. You know, these crossings, we typically we're not looking at legs of more than sort of four and a half, five hours. But make sure that you've got time to sit somewhere and not pressure yourself into departing and getting the aircraft to their destination as soon as possible. You leave from where in the United States? A delivery center is in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, which is not... Not too bad for us, it's two or three legs. We then land up in Bagotville, just northeast of Boston. Uh, okay, so you, you're, you're, you're on the coast over yeah. there. In Bagotville, Goose Bay into Canada, and up the east coast of Canada. Right, and then? Um, there's a few options. We've done the jet, uh, the Vision jet across, and that is a little bit easier because uh, of uh, the fact that you can take it at altitude. Uh, but again, single engine and very comfortable. You've still got a parachute sitting there and you've still got the safety factors, which uh, I think, um, you know, sort of outweigh in a lot of ways um, the, the, the sense of security you may get out of a twin. Um, but you can go to altitude. Um, there is an airspace there called Gander. And that Gander airspace has got a, a 24,000 uh, feet limit. Uh, if you don't have an HF radio. So if you've got an HF radio, you can go over it. If you've got, a, if you haven't, if you've got an HF radio, uh, you, you can go under it. Um, and so we go up the east coast up to uh, Iqaluit um, to miss that airspace. Uh, we're flying between sort right. of 10, 10 and 12,000 feet, um, trying to get the most uh, out of the, the efficiency there. And just also remember we're flying normally aspirated aeroplanes. 90% uh, of the time, not a lot of the aeroplanes that come to South Africa are turbo, and not a lot of the aircraft have FICI or flight into known icing equipment on board. On average, how many days do you take to do a crossing, provided you are not held up by, by weather? And, 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 and if things go normally, how many days uh, do you accomplish a crossing in? About 55 hours. Uh, and that we typically do in about 10 days. So we're trying to, trying to do two legs a day. Um, and it's, you, you're looking at up to about 11, 10, 1100 miles a day. Um, you've obviously got to you know, consider your own limitations and your FTPs. So typically we'll do um, a crossing on, into, into Europe um, and we'll land up in um, a nice place like Ireland where we can have a bit of Guinness and have a couple of nights. Uh, my daughter's yes. in Ireland and uh, uh, so it's nice to stop off there and, and, and it's very important. I think, you know, a lot of the, the, the ferry pilots out there um, get paid virtually, you know, by the kilometres. So they just want to get the aeroplane across and, and, on and start on yeah. the next one. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're doing it for our customers um, and uh, we, uh, if we take two or three days longer, it's, it's not going to... What about cabin heating or the clothing that you wear in the event that you, you have to parachute down uh, onto, the, onto the surface? Yeah. Uh, what, 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 what are you dressing yourselves in? I would typically wear uh, thermals plus a survival suit. Um, I'd have the life, life raft uh, right next to me. Um, and with that, a bag of essential survival gear, uh, satellite radio, um, flares, uh, satellite phone, flares, um, water, uh, water, rope, um, just the little things, uh, lots of water, lots of energy bars, uh, if I can sneak it in, a bit of biltong, um, just something to keep you going. Uh, I've got to say, the, 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 the Canadian Gander airspace, Greenland airspace, Iceland airspace, air traffic control is phenomenal. Um, they're always updating you with weather, they're always updating you um, with important information. Um, there are areas that they can't uh, get you on secondary surveillance, um, and they, they make you aware of that. 
Uh, they give you a sat phone number, they take your sat phone number. Would they tell you when you can expect to make VHF contact yeah. with, with, with the next service provider? So, so because we don't have HF and we have to fly around the Skanda airspace, um, they will quite often tell you that you're probably going to lose uh, uh, contact. They'll give you forward frequencies. Um, if you can uh, and you are going onto a forward frequency, you do obviously try and make contact and tell them you hand it over. But they're really good at, at um, uh, getting position reports out of you. So, uh, you know, get used to giving lat longs um, to the controller. You've got no other um, uh, GPS waypoints. Uh, radio waypoints that you can refer to oh. a lot of these places. So nothing's changed in that respect. No. It, it was the same in airline operations as well. Uh, and, and, and you had to have those Latin longs yeah. off pat and, uh, and, and convey, convey that message, yeah. but exactly, without any yeah. mistakes. And I recall on, on, on the one crossing we did in the jet, we sat in the tower at uh, Nisasarik and the guy said, look, we're going to just ask you for two or three lat long positions on the way, these are what they are. Shove them into your GPS and uh, makes life easier. We got the one waypoint out by, I think, two or three degrees, for whatever reason. Wrote it down wrong, put it in the database wrong, whatever it was. And when we reported there, um, they weren't happy with us. You know, no. although there was very little traffic around, yes. they are so safety conscious and so aware of the dangers of flying in that area, that uh, those sort of little things were so important to them. Oh. Um, you know. and, and so they should be. So they, um, typically, I think I heard you say earlier on that you operate between nine, ten, and eleven thousand feet with the with the Cirrus Twenty Two. It's uh, between eleven and twelve thousand if we can. Uh, Right, and then are you taking supplementary oxygen above eleven? Yeah, so we we have oxygen in in the plane, uh, and it's a it's a standby set. It's not part of the aircraft. And next, of course, we're in a turbo. Uh, the Cirrus Twenty Two comes with uh, turbo comes with twenty uh, with oxygen, and it's certified up to twenty four thousand feet. So if you really wanted to, you could get around weather, and 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 is very popular in the states because right they have I think a lot more adverse weather. Than we do here. Yes, but yeah, if, if it's a if it's a long a long haul, we are trying to go as high as we can. To but then you you you're carrying sufficient supplementary oxygen, yeah. and and then uh, by comparison, when you brought the vision jet out, what altitudes uh, did you uh, did you fly at there? So we flew at um, their max, so it's a 30, 31,000 feet. Uh, very different trip. Uh, about 35 hours um, and uh, planning very different uh, we could instead of going up top of Greenland we went through the bottom of Greenland up, went to Iceland of course we went to Ireland and uh, had our standard stay there um, we landed up then going down the west coast of Africa so we went to Spain and we were forced to spend a couple of days there um, uh, and mainly because of the, the visa problems getting into Africa, uh, we were a little behind on, on, on that side and had to wait a day, but it was fortuitous, it was in Spain. But again, planning different, Jet A1, every single airport you go to has got Jet A1. Yep. It's available in a Bowser, it comes to you, it's easy. Avgas, Cirrus 22s, um, is a lot more planning, It's you've got a route through Europe, um, through Italy, Greece, and then make arrangements in Egypt. Uh, the Air Force are the only guys who've really got to have gas uh, for their trainers, so you've got to arrange with, with them. That can be challenging. Um, so a couple of stops in Egypt, uh, northern uh, um, uh, Kenya, again, drummed fuel up to a place called Loki Choki, nice little airfield in the middle of nowhere. Um, Nairobi, and then obviously it gets easier and easier as you get uh, further south. You're right. So you've done these eight, and uh, I believe your next one is going to be in a, a, a Pratt & Whitney PT6 powered Kodiak. You're going to be bringing that out. Yeah, so that's going to be exciting to do, and uh, I've got a warm, fuzzy feeling. We know how good the PT6 is, um, but a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling after listening to your um, chat to uh, the guys in Canada 
um, the other night. Um, you know, the fact about the in-flight shutdown rate in-flight being shutdown only two in one million uh, hours. Quite incredible. Yeah, it is. So that that gives you a warm fuzzy feeling. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's a superb airplane. Oh. It's, uh, it, it's probably also 55 hours. Um, it doesn't have the parachute, but you've got to weigh that up against the fact that you've got a, 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 an engine that is uh, far more reliable than any piston out there. Yeah. Tony, it's been terrific talking to you, and you've really opened my eyes and you, you will have opened up plenty of other eyes. Uh, uh, this is a fascinating subject uh, and uh, I wish you many, many more crossings in Thank the you. future. <laughs>